to hell! What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Jay, coming at you with another Splatter Talk Cinema Review. Today, I'm going to be reviewing a movie that brought the horror anthology to the hood. Today, Splatter Talk Cinema will be reviewing Tales from the Hood. Released in 1995, this film brings its audience four short urban-style stories based on the different things troubling the African-American community at that time. Starring Clarence Williams III as the master of ceremonies, Mr. Sims, we are taken on a horrifying ride down into hell. With a budget of $6 million, does Tales from the Hood deliver? I don't know. Let's find out. We open the movie to an SUV pulling up in a nice suburban area. Out jump three gangsters. Stack, played by Joe Torre. Ball, played by DeAndre Bonds. And the leader, Bulldog, played by Samuel Monroe Jr., what the hell could they possibly be in that neck of the woods for? The camera pans to show the trio at a funeral home to get some drugs? When was the last time you stopped at a mortuary to get a joint? They walked up on the porch and knocked on the door. The blind flies open, scaring the three G's. One runs off and gets clotheslined. The mortician, Mr. Sims, claims that he's found a stack of drugs in the alley. The shit. The shit that you found. Who in the hell has a stack of drugs in the alley just sitting there? This story is already suspicious. The four men start to walk through the mortuary until Mr. Sims brings them to a coffin. This is where the first story begins. It's called Rogue Cop Revelation. On his first night on the job, a young black cop by the name of Clarence is going with his partner on a routine traffic stop of a well-dressed black man. As he witnessed the black man getting harassed, he goes over to call his superior officer out on it. Clarence was told to go and run his plates. Clarence gets in the car, runs the plates, and realizes it's a local politician, Martin Morehouse. You guys may recognize the actor that plays Martin Morehouse. His name is Tom Wright. He's also the actor that played the corpse in Creepshow 2's The Hitchhiker. The councilman has been responsible for taking corrupt cops down. Damn son of a bitch. I've got nothing against good cops. You what? I said I've got nothing against good cops, but I will see lowlife scum like you run out of the department. As Clarence runs his plates, Newton, Billy, and Strom, three corrupt cops, continue to beat the living shit out of Martin. Clarence comes back to the three telling him that Martin needed to go to a hospital. Billy and Clarence leave, and Newton and Strom take Martin. In the car, Newton tells Clarence about the code. You don't ever roll over, and you never rat out a fellow officer, and you never Never break the code. Strom and Billy drive Martin down to the docks. Strom proceeds to shoot the politician up with heroin. They also plant some in his trunk. Strom backs Martin's car up, puts it in drive, and drives it off the side into the water with Martin still in it. This falsely labels Martin a hypocrite after his death. One year later, Clarence has quit the force and has become a raging alcoholic. He staggers through his neighborhood until he comes up to a mural of Martin Morehouse. Clarence then has the vision of Martin crucified. He also hears him say, Bring them to me. I will. Clarence agrees and convinces the three cops to meet him at Martin's cemetery plot. The three officers find Clarence and begin to heckle him and Martin. Clarence tells them to come down to Martin's plot. They go there and Strom proceeds to piss on his grave. Strom calls back to Billy to do the same. Reluctant, Billy walks up to the grave. As he's pissing, a hand bursts out of the grave and grabs Billy's junk. Everyone starts going fucking crazy as Billy's getting pulled down into the grave. Not having that shit, Strom lets off a few rounds at the plot. With an explosion, Billy is revealed to have his heart ripped out of his chest by a zombified Martin standing over him. Strom and Newton get the fuck out of Dodge. 
They are ripping and running the streets until they crash into a parked car. The two cops try to figure out what the hell is going on. Then, bam, Martin rips through the roof of the car and pulls Strom up, decapitating him. Newton runs out of the car and puts a few rounds into the car and Martin also. Magically, the car blows up with Martin standing on it. Newton staggers over to the mural of Martin and goes fucking ballistic. Bragging that he had killed Martin, he turned around and Martin standing right there in front of him. He picks his bitch ass up by the neck, but the cop escapes. Martin proceeds to use his telekinesis to shoot needles into a running Newton. The needles push him and push into his skin and it pushes him up to a cross and with one needle in his mouth, it turns him into a fucking mural, leaving Martin to say, Welcome to my world. Clarence confronts Martin, asking him if he was happy. Martin chokes him the hell up, asking him where was he when he needed him. When Clarence is dropped, we cut to him being evaluated in a nut house. Apparently, the three murdered cops had been pinned on him. Poor fucking bastard. We fade to the funeral home where we find the three gangsters and Mr. Sims walking to the next room. Mr. Sims opens the coffin to reveal the next story. Boys do get bruised. We open to a little boy's bedroom. He was fast asleep until he was awakened by a monster outside his door. With his flashlight in hand, he watches as the door is turning. We cut to the next day. The little boy, Walter, is enjoying his first day of school by being embarrassed and beat the fuck up. The teachers come and rescue Walter from getting his shit split. In the school nurse's office, it is revealed that Walter has old bruises. Not from the kid that was kicking his ass, but Walter refused to tell the teachers or the nurse how he got it. He finally gives in and tells them the monster who came when his dad died. The teacher thinks he's bullshitting, but he's really not. We cut back to Walter's house. We are in his room. Walter's in his bed, listening to the footsteps outside his room. The doorknob starts to jiggle, and the door finally opens to reveal a nasty-looking hand. A crying Walter lies back to receive whatever was coming to him. The next day, Walter walks up to hand in his paper when the teacher notices a huge bruise on Walter's wrist. The teacher asks where he got the bruise. And Walter could only say, he's back. The nurse wrapped his wrist up and sent him on his way. We cut to night outside Walter's room where we can hear him getting beat. The next day, Walter skips recess. He's drawing a picture of the monster. Apparently, Lori, who sits behind him in class, told him if he drew him and destroyed the drawing, the monster would go away. Shit, I got a few people I like to draw a picture of. Anyway, Walter even draws a picture of Tyrone, the bully who kicked his ass. If I was getting my ass kicked to recess, I wouldn't want to go out there either. The teacher asked him if he could talk to his mother about it. They agreed to talk after recess. When the teacher leaves, he knocks over the picture of Tyrone Walter had been drawing. Walter gets up, looks at the drawing, picks it up, and crumples it. But as he disposes of the drawing, you hear a blood-curdling scream from one of the kids outside. <laughs> Apparently... Tyrone had suddenly fallen down the stairs and broke both of his arms and his legs. Stupid ass teacher assistant says, Boy must have had weak bones. Come the fuck on. That night, the teacher comes over to Walter's house. Walter's mom, Miss Johnson, opens the door in a towel. Who the fuck opens their door in a fucking towel? Especially when you have an asshole domesticator for a boyfriend. She lets him in. They start talking about the monster Walter mentioned. Not having any of that shit, Miss Johnson calls Walter downstairs and scolds him. All of a sudden, Miss Johnson's boyfriend beeps. Miss Johnson and Walter become frightened and ask the teacher to leave. The boyfriend comes in the door, acting like an asshole. He walks past the teacher. The teacher and the boyfriend talk about Walter with the boyfriend assuring him that he would talk to Walter. The teacher leaves. While in his car, the teacher sees that someone is getting beat and runs to the rescue. He comes in the house to get his ass handed to him. We find out that the boyfriend is indeed the monster Walter had been talking about. When things were looking bad for Miss Johnson, Walter grabs the drawing and folds it at the monster's arm. This folds the boyfriend's arm. Lori at school was fucking right. So Walter starts to crumple the drawing, leaving the boyfriend in a puddle of bullshit. 
The teacher tells Walter to burn the drawing. The drawing burns as we hear the scream of the woman-beaten asshole. We fade back into the funeral home, showing the remains of a charred boyfriend. The gangsters are getting sketched the fuck out. Stax had enough and slammed the coffin shut, knocking a doll off the mantle. Mr. Sims picks the doll up to introduce us to KKK comeuppance. We open up to Duke Mecker's campaign for governor. Him and his Uncle Tom assistant talk as an angry mob chants outside, Duke must go. We learn Duke is an ex clansman who has acquired an old plantation home as his base of operation. There's reporters outside, but none of them have shit on the old dude. Yo, the old black dude took over the newscast. There's no fucking peace in the dollhouse now. Love characters who drop exposition on the audience. Duke drops exposition of his own about a mural on his wall and about dolls in the mural. The first thing that Uncle Tom wants Duke to work on is his public appearance, but he can't get past the mural on the fucking wall and how it's creeping him out. The camera pans down below the house to reveal a doll. Oh, shit. As they do their public relations practice, the Uncle Tom falls down the stairs and kills himself? Okay, now I've fallen down the stairs and I'm still here. What the fuck? The next day, we're at his funeral. The next day? Holy shit. The news start to talk to Duke and then the old man pops out and gives up exposition again. They want reparations. Duke and company get in the limo and he finds a doll. He throws it out the window and they keep moving. Later in the night, Duke is all alone reviewing the tape of the accident. He catches something on the video. It's that fucking doll with his legs sticking out. That doll's little ass leg tripped up a grown ass man. Get the fuck out of here. Now we see a POV of a doll running up to the house. Duke gets a knock on the door. He opens it to reveal nothing. He hears some pitter patter of feet and he looks to see nothing. He closes the door, turns around to see a doll. Here come the racial slurs, then Duke throws a vase at him. Somehow the doll disappears right in front of his fucking eyes. Okay, now I don't get it. He hears shit in the other room, so he goes to check. Nothing. No doll in his office? I'm sorry, but how the hell is a grown-ass man gonna be scared of a little-ass doll? Duke grabs the American flag and beats the mural with it. The mural starts to bleed. Duke turns to this little motherfucker, swinging on the chandelier. The doll attacks him, but Duke slams him with the flag. We cut to the doll being pinned on the dartboard. I'm sorry, but this is when the racial slurs start to get funny to me. I'm for real. This is hilarious. I'm going to blow off your little nigga balls. Duke goes back in the mural to see more dolls missing. Coming out of the office, he says the best line in this short. I'm not afraid of you. I'll kill one of you. I'll kill you all. You you little nigglings. I don't understand why he doesn't get the hell out of there, though. He sees the doll standing in the hallway As he tries to load his gun, the doll runs up and chases him back into his office with the mural and a bunch of missing motherfucking dolls. It's all over for him. It's all over for you, Mr. Medgar. As the dolls attack him, the voodoo lady appears in the room holding the main doll as the rest of the dolls eat his ass. Mr. Sims puts the doll down. Stack isn't falling for that bullshit. I mean, fuck a boy. The three gangsters are becoming a little impatient. They just want to get this shit and go. As they walk up to the next room, ball starts to flip. As they walk up to the coffin, Mr. Sims asks if they knew the man in the coffin. One gangster says yes, but Bulldog says hell nah. This brings us to our next story. Hardcore Convert. The story opens up with Spice One bumping in the speakers. The guy driving sees a red car driving by a rival gang member... He pulls up to the red car. The guy gets out and Crazy K shoots him, calling him a bitch ass nigga. Three gangsters come out of the house and shoot Crazy K. As the three gangsters stand over him, the cops show up and it's a huge shootout. The three get shot and the cops take Crazy K. Skip to the next scene where Crazy K, real name Jerome, sits in jail. 
Dr. Cushing walks up to his cell and asks if he wants to get out. He agrees and they transport him to some gothic ass place in the hills. We arrive at the shit and the shit looks like something out of Batman and Robin. They bring Jerome to a cell next to a Nazi. Here comes some more racial slurs, but it's all in good taste. It's all in the movie. I mean, hating on somebody because of their race, gender, ethnicity, or whatever, that's some bullshit. But um, this is just a movie, so let's keep rolling. The Klansman asks Jerome to be in the army where whites take over. Jerome punches him square in the shit. The Klansman reminds Jerome of the people that he killed, and they were black too. We cut to Jerome being brought to another room. The room has a fucking carnival ride in the middle of it. I don't know. They strap his ass to it and they start it up. We go into a montage of gangster killing. I actually love this part of the movie because the Spice One track in the background, also with the clips of the black on black violence that was happening back in the 90s, that's a real culture shock and people really don't understand that. But anyway, we cut to the next room. Jerome is being lowered into what the warden calls the sensory deprivation chamber. He, Jerome, meets the people that he has killed over the years. But getting tired of all that bullshit, Jerome tells the warden that he doesn't give a fuck about another motherfucker and any chance of freedom. So, she lets him go, and everyone disappears. We reappear to Jerome, lying in the streets, bleeding, like the beginning of the short. But this time, instead of the cops saving him, the three gangsters kill him. Whoa. Cut back to the funeral home. The three gangsters feel some type of way about that last story. It's revealed that the three gangsters who killed Jerome were Stack, Ball, and Bulldog. Done with the nonsense, they demand the shit from Mr. Sims. He takes them down to the basement and points out three coffins where he said the shit is. The gangsters go over to the coffins. Stax opens his coffin to reveal himself dead. Each gangster opens their coffins to see themselves. Mr. Sims informs them that when they killed Jerome, some of his boys killed them. Bulldog can't believe it and says the best line in the fucking movie. <laughs> Motherfucker bullshit! If we dead, then what the fuck we doing in a funeral home with your crazy ass on? Back in 1995, I saw this movie in the theater with Sin and a few of our friends. We were definitely pleased with the movie. Today, I feel it stands up. The acting was great from everybody involved in this movie. Clarence Williams the third put such an explanation point on the movie as the creepy director Mr. Sims. Joe Torrey, DeAndre Bonds, and Samuel Monroe Jr. added wonderful comic relief to the movie which you would think wouldn't have any comedy in it at all. Road Cop Revelations is very creepy, and is creepy to this day. I actually believe Wing Hosser, the actor who played Strom, the way he portrayed his character was amazing. He was definitely the standout in this short. In Boys Do Get Bruised, David Allen Greer surprised the shit out of me. Back in those days, all I remember him from was In Living Color, Blank Man, and I'm Gonna Get You Sucker comedies. To see him play the role of the monster was something I did not see coming. He was the standout in this one. In KKK comeuppance, Corbin Bernstein, Duke Metger was the standout performance. His racism, his southern charm, his exposition was great. I loved the racist remarks he said during the short. And I'm a black man. They were funny. I'm sorry. In Hardcore Convert, Jerome Crazy K was played by Lamont Bentley. The violence of this short was huge. It was a huge eye-opener for its time. Seeing the little girl with the bullet in her chest, it was very alarming and very true. Unfortunately, too many innocent victims are claimed. The ending of this movie was amazing. While watching Crazy K get shot up by three gangsters, I actually had no idea it was Stack Ball and Bulldog until it was revealed. For real, I was on the edge of my seat. I mean, right now it could be projected, but when I first saw this movie, I remember the twist, and I remember saying, oh, shit. But then, when Mr. Sims gave them the shit, I was surprised and pleased as well. This is your boy Jay, reviewing what I think is a classic in his own right, Tales from the Hood, number one.
They uh, fucked up the series and made it number two, and I'm going to be reviewing that, but I'm also going to have a special guest as I review that. So to be continued with part two, Keith David, you're off the hook for right now. But if you're new to the channel, go ahead, hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you can get all the notifications from Splatter Talk Cinema Review. Give us a like and give us your comments down below, your ideas, your thoughts. If you liked it, if you didn't like it, give us your comments and thoughts and we can talk about it. All right. This is your boy, Jay, Splatter Talk Cinema Review. Happy Halloween!